the next uh, presentation foreseen is on the grant management process. Uh, and there will be some explanation on that by Mr. Boving, so um, who is the head of the ground management sector in DG Justice. So I would like to uh, give him the floor, Philippe. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Yes. Do you see me? Do, do you hear yes. me here? Okay, Perfect. fine. Thank you. I, I will try first to upload my presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, does it work? Yes, it works. We see it. You see it? Yes. Ah, that's great. You see it, but I don't see it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is this is a miracle of technology. Okay, but you see it then. Yeah, yeah, we see. We are on the first page. It's not in full screen mode, but that doesn't matter. It's uh, it's um, it's visible. Uh, if you want, I can change. Yeah, but uh, okay, I'm not a specialist. But if if I change, do you see? Yes, it goes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are okay. on the second page. Okay, yeah. that's great because then I have I have you in front of me on my screen, which uh, I have the impression to talk to someone at least, which is which is good. Um, so I, I guess this is the most technical part of of the day. Um, at this time of the day, I guess it will be it will be quite tough. Um, but okay, we will we will try to get to go through it. Um, so I will I will give you a, a few a few words of explanation about the uh, grant management process. I, I don't know if uh, you are all familiar with the process. Some of you are, some of you maybe are not. Um, but so I will try to make really a general presentation with a few do's and don'ts as well. Uh, so here you have a picture of the process. In fact, the process should begin already uh, a, a little more at the left, should be extended a little more at the left side, where you have the publication of the call, the closure of the call, uh, the submission of the proposal, the evaluation of the proposal, and then you have the process of the grant agreement. Okay, so you see there where we start after the evaluation of the proposal, you have the grant agreement, preparation, the signature, then you have the uh, project duration, the final report, and the closing of the project. That's more or less the process. Um, so the explanation I will give you is indeed about the um, grant management process, but all this is also to take into account when you submit a proposal, of course. So it's uh, uh, when, when we will discuss the budget, the budget is something that you do at proposal stage, of course. OK, so when um, we, we are now at the grant preparation stage. So if I take the process, we went through the evaluation, eval proposal have been pos positively evaluated and the uh, successful applicants receive an invitation letter. So that means that they are invited to enter into the contractual process, process of contractual, contractualization of uh, the, the agreement, the grant agreement. And uh, so you receive this with a, a, an evaluation summary report, which is the, the, the summary of the evaluation done by the experts. OK, so you are invited to enter into this grant agreement process, preparation process. In DG Just, what we do to help you in this process is immediately after you receive this invitation letter, we send you immediately through the portal because all the communication happens through the funding and tender portal. Everything is automatic. Everything is digital. Uh, we send you a communication with the main instruction. So we will take you by the hand into the entire process. OK, that's the idea. So what is the, the grant agreement preparation? In fact, um, the, the grant agreement preparation is not really a negotiation. We will not renegotiate your proposal. Your proposal is, voila, you, you, as you have been, you have got the explanation today, 
uh, the call of proposal, the call for proposal are published now on the funding and tender on the funding and tender portal. You see all the condition and you draft your proposal, part A and part B. You submit this proposal, they are evaluated by the experts, and then we put them in this grant agreement. The idea is, in fact, also for reason of equal treatment, that we do not renegotiate a proposal. If indeed uh, you go through the process of evaluation and then you change completely the consortium, of course, it is not the same uh, proposal as the one that has been evaluated that would be granted. So the idea is, it is not a full renegotiation. It is, we take the proposal as it is submitted, but we will fine tune, okay? And there are some changes. So what do we change, in fact, in this process? First, we set, we set the date. We set the date, uh, the starting date. Normally, it is the first day of the month after the entry into force of the agreement or it is a fixed start date. But be careful because we do not like too much the uh, retroactive starting date. Um, then also, and we notice that also, I don't know uh, for the ones who are familiar, we, we do not like uh, retroactive starting date and we do not like too much either the uh, starting date too, too long to find the future. Sometimes, um, uh, beneficiaries apply to a grant for a starting date in, in, in one year, for instance. But there is a kind of disconnection then with the call for proposal. So we, we try, we would like the, the action uh, to start within the six months um, of the signature of the grant. That's the idea, with exception, of course. Duration, okay, uh, in principle, 24 months. Um, we set also the EU contribution and the pre-financing. So EU contribution for justice up to 90% with a pre-financing of 65%. So the, the idea of the grants is that we give you the money to uh, complete the, uh, the action. So uh, we, we give you almost everything you need to, to do the project up to the end. Uh, then in the grant preparation agreement, in this phase, uh, uh, an important part of it is the validation of the entities, the full validation of the entities. This is not done by us. This is done by the research executive agency. But everything is automated as well. You receive automatic email, etc. So it's quite, it's a really a, an easy process. It is an easy process as long as you answer quickly, of course. If you take too much time for answering, then it delay the entire process. We check again the uh, eligibility, the exclusion, and we check the financial capacity of the applicants, not for the public organization, but for the private entities. We always check the financial capacity. We want to make, to make sure, but it's kind of a formal check. But anyway, we, it's a kind of security that we built in to make sure that uh, the uh, beneficiaries are capable to, to bring the, the project to a good end. So we run a few ratios. Now, if the financial capacity is not good, then we can take measures. Indeed, we do not pay the pre-financing in full. We split the pre-financing. We may replace the coordinator of the project as well. So we may take some measures. Um, in this phase also, we uh, implement the evaluation summary report comments. So that means if there are comments from the evaluators on the cost efficiency, if they say the budget must be, revi the budget must be revised or whatever, we do it at this time. We check also the um, plagiarism, we, if there are double funding, etc. We have some building tools to check that, uh, data analysis, etc. So we run the check we can at this stage. We check the budget. We check the uh, clerical errors and the inconsistencies. And we draw your attention on the uh, EU visibility rules. OK, so this is a kind of important, of important phase in the life of the project. 
Now I will I will give you a few elements about the um, the 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 budget of the action. And the budget of the action, I, I mentioned it here, but of course, this is an important part of your proposal. When you make your proposal, so you, you make your proposal, the objective of your proposal, etc. You will also have some deliverables in your in your proposal, work package, etc., work streams. And you you of course have to evaluate what kind of input you need to achieve your output. And that's your budget. Um, now we we used to have I don't know for the for for those of you uh, who were familiar to the programs in the past we used to have a, a detailed budget an Excel detailed budget table and it was awfully detailed so you had to mention all the names of e each uh, staff member working on the project with the uh, plan number of hours etc etc so. Um, and the, the fact is that a lot of applicants complained because for a lot of them, it was a double entry because they already have an internal tool, a bookkeeping tool or cost, cost accounting tool that allowed them to make this kind of budgeting. While um, if they had to fill in uh, an Excel table afterwards, it was a double work. So we, we dropped it for a uh, simplification reason and for lightening the burden on your shoulder. But now we recommend you, of course, to have a detailed budget of what you plan to do. If you want to have an idea of a budget, you need to know how many hours of people of this category are working on the project, etc. How many travel you foresee, etc. So this is really important. So we recommend you to still have something like that. Now, the, the kind of project we have, the kind of budget is a, is a mix between actual and unit cost. For those of you who were working also in the past, normally we always add only actual cost. Now in the new framework program, we also introduce the unit cost. So we have the, the actual cost still is, is the rule, but we also have the unit cost for travel and subsistence, for SME owners and for volunteers. I, I will come back to this. A big simplification as well compared to what we used to have before is that the budget transfer are free. Before there were bit budget transfer between categories of cost between participants, etc. They are free as long as it does not they do not imply a substantial change in the description of work. Before there were limitations, a limitation may lead to rejection of cost. Rejection of cost. So this is a, a, a big, quite a substantial simplification as well. Now, what are the cost categories? We have the personal cost, so it's actual cost. Uh, what is uh, personal cost? It's quite easy. You take the daily rate of a person times the number of days work on the action. This is really simple. And uh, the daily rate, it's also a simplification because before we used to have a lot of, of, of complicated ways to calculate the number of productive hours, etc. It could be you could lose your way indeed into this. Uh, now it's quite straightforward. It's the annual personal cost. So it's the total cost of a person divided by 215 as a number of uh, billable days. OK, so you may not bill more than 215. You may not charge 230. The, the maximum is 215. Then we have also the, the unit cost under the personal cost category is for the SME owners. SME owners are people um, self-employed uh, who, who do not get, get, get a, a salary from, from their company, for instance. If you are an SME owner, the boss of a, of a small company, you do not get a, a, a salary from your company. Maybe you charge some the rental of your car or whatever, but you do not charge a, a salary, which means that there is no cost. So as there is no cost, 
uh, we need to take a kind of proxy and um, we, we have the, a unit cost uh, that is based on the Marie Curie program rates. This is fully documented. Then we have the, the volunteer cost. The volunteer cost is a new cost category uh, for this new framework program. It was not activated before, um, and this will be activated in function of the calls. So not for all the calls. Under the justice calls, I think it's only for the judicial cooperation that we activate the volunteer cost. So the principle of the volunteer cost is in fact to help the, to support the applicants in, uh, in financing the co-financing. Because as you know, we in our, in our grants, we never finance 100%. That's the idea of the, the funding of the commission. Uh, the uh, beneficiaries are not supposed to make any profit with our money and they are not supposed they are supposed to co-finance the action they are supposed to have some some uh, proper means also to to participate to the action and so uh, we said voila we have a co-financing 10 percent for justice 20 percent for serve etc no even if the co-financing is rather limited we, we had some complaints of beneficiaries saying, yes, but we cannot co-finance. So what we found is indeed the voluntary cost. And the voluntary cost means they, the, they, may, take, they may be taken into account for this co-financing part, okay? Because the commission will only uh, reimburse the actual cost. So the volunteer is a, is a, is a, is a unit cost. So in, in the Annex 2A to the grant agreement, you will find that on the funding and, uh, funding and tender portal. In the Annex 2A, uh, you will have all these daily rate per country, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, this is, but this is call dependent. Then we have the sub subcontracting as we used to have, is actual cost as well. And again, this is really important for all these actual costs best value for money. So uh, that means if, and uh, we have a lot of cases like that, and it's really a pity eh, that uh, uh, if you, you, you subcontract something, if you make a, a big purchase and an investment, please try to be able to prove that this is the best value for money. So if so, by, by um, keeping some, some offers, some tenders. Okay, this is really important. Then the travel and subsistence, we have also now unit costs. We used to have actual costs before, now it's unit costs. So it is kind of complicated. You will see that in the Annex 2A. So this will be the new rule. It's uh, no actual anymore, only unit cost. So um, you will see that there are rules in function of the travel below 400, above 400, and uh, it will be in function of the distance. You have also calculators available. So it's much easier. You have the number of persons traveling from there to there, and you apply the calculator. Boom, it's kind of straightforward. The same for the accommod accommodation cost and for the subsistence cost, okay? In function of the country where you're staying, uh, it's one unit cost. Uh, then for the equipment, you may, as usual, charge only the depreciation of the uh, of the equipment. Uh, voilà. If it's a, a depreciation of uh, three years and a project of two years, it's only two thirds that may be charged. This is obvious. Um, then we have a new category there, the financial support to third parties, and this also will be called dependent. So it will be activated or not in the call. This is rather important. It, so you, you should pay attention to the call, huh? really the condition of the call. Um, the uh, financial support to third parties, it's a cascading grant, in fact. Huh? So that allows you to sub-grant to uh, beneficiaries. But there are lots of conditions 
for this. Um, then we have the other cost, actual cost also, and then we have the indirect cost with a lump sum of uh, 7%. Okay, this is as usual. Cost eligibility, the rules did not change. Okay, so it's as usual. So it's cost actually incurred. And what is a cost? A cost becomes a cost when it is booked in the bookkeeping. As long as it is not booked, it is not a cost. So, of course, it must be incurred, it must be in the bookkeeping, it must be paid. Um, then we, uh, an important part is the supporting evidence. And the supporting evidence is for the actual cost. Of course, we need uh, the contracts, the subcontracts, the invoice, the accounting records. So this is kind of... Uh, um, really important documents that needs to be kept for the unit cost and contributions but for in our case for the unit cost um, supporting documents to prove the number of units so for for the travel it may be in an invoice with a tra travel agency saying yeah, what are they going from there to there but we do not need the uh, bookkeeping records or attendance list for instance but to, of course, we need to know also the, the country of origin. And then for the uh, personal cost, uh, we quite kind of simplified also the uh, usual timesheet uh, requirement by asking now uh, a monthly declaration signed by the person and the supervisor. But still, we need it. Huh? So this is kind. This is important. Then we have also in the, in our system now, and this is kind of recent also, but for the ones who have applied to the last uh, calls, we you know it, the continuous reporting, that allows us to follow regularly the project and the development of the project. Because as you know, in the uh, uh, description of the work, you will list your deliverables with a time for submission of all these deliverables and also the milestones of the project. And so with the continuous reporting, you submit uh, uh, during the lifetime of the project all the deliverables when they are ready. And this allows us also to check if the, the project is on time, if, if there are no delays, etc. Okay. And of course, we can amend the project. Huh? So uh, we we try not to uh, to have too many amendments to try to limit the number of amendments. But of course, uh, uh, as projects uh, last a few years, it's normal that we may change that. Uh, voilà. Well, priorities may change or what. Voilà. Okay. Now, just a, 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 a small insight in the. The most frequent errors um, that we have uh, at, at grant management stage. So it's of course the, in the personal cost, uh, unreliable or, or missing timesheets. This is always the same. Uh, insufficient supporting documents, incorrect time claimed, um, ineligible remuneration, so cost without valid supporting documents. So e voila, we, uh, a travel cost also not related to the action, not possible to make uh, the, the link between uh, the, uh, the action and, and the cost. Um, and I, I must say that sometimes it's really painful huh? because uh, it's, uh, as you know, you 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 make your project, you submit your proposal, we conclude the grant agreement, and then the action is running. And in fact, on the basis of the budget as it is submitted, and also at the time of final payment, we kind of trust your declaration, of course. Right? It's a it's a it's a trust-based relationship. But of course, we have audit after the final payment of the project. And that's where the, the bad surprise may come indeed if all this evidence is not kept, if indeed uh, the, the rules are not followed. The, the rules are, we, we are really in a process of simplification already since 
it's always more simplification to all the framework program. So we we still are simplifying, but still there are, there are rules. Now, a, a few tips to avoid the most frequent errors. Of course, for the staff, the timesheet. Uh, only the hours uh, claim, only the hours uh, actually worked on the project. The remuneration must be in line with the usual practices, of course. Uh, this is not, uh, it is not because it is an EU funded that we need to increase the, the rates. Uh, evidence, payroll, employment contracts, and they must be in line with the law, of course. Uh, so always prove the link with the action, link to the action. And uh, um, the reconciliation between the cost and the uh, bookkeeping records. So we need everything needs to be identifiable in the bookkeeping of the organization. Okay, best value for money, as we said, and uh, everything needs to be as an actual cost. No, miss. Maybe before uh, terminating. Uh, I would like to give you just a, a few tips for, for a successful project. And I think uh, those are quite, quite important because indeed it's really the, we, we need, you need to stick to the call. Uh, where, where really the, 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 the call for proposal defines what, what we want to find into the proposal. The, the consortium building is really important. Because of course, uh, voila, you 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 will you work together. You're supposed to uh, achieve an objective together. So the the consortium is important, and also there is a collective responsibility. You are collectively responsible for achieving the results. So it's it's good to have a good consortium. Um, what is important is to have sufficient time for the management of the project. Because, of course, the coordinator, for instance, he has to manage to, to collect and to make sure that the, the other beneficiaries submit the information, etc. Um, there must be a high level of partners. And what is really important as well is to uh, have good working relationship with the project officer. So when we uh, when we send the invitation letter in the very beginning of the project, you have the name of your main contact person and the, uh, who is the uh, project officer. And the project officer will, will be your main contact person uh, during the entire project duration. So contact him each time you have a question or whatever, and it's really easy through the system with the communication tool you write. It's even much easier than, than writing an email. It's just clicking on, a, on an icon and boom, you send a message. Um, you should have also a sufficient expertise in financial management to make sure that everything is uh, properly recorded. Um, so anticipate problem and of course be be honest in your reports but but i i, I guess everybody is honest uh, around the table huh? even if we don't have a table um voila so that was my contribution and and we are there to to support you uh, for for making really a, a success of your project thank you for your attention <laughs>